Hello and welcome to the Eastman's Predator Pros Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Nimnick, and we are back. Although this podcast is coming from you live, the actual body of it um, from the Western Hunting Conservation Act. So I'm actually back at my house now. Um, I'm recording the intro from this uh, just to save on time when we're at that show. Um, I just like to jump right into it. So, so yeah, it should be an awesome one. Uh, you know, Brandon Maddox is the CEO of Silencer Central, a guy that I've been wanting to get on here for a long time just to talk suppressors um, and, and that whole gamut of information that's out there. So I was able to meet Brandon in person at the show. Um, just an interesting guy, man, his backstory and how he kind of started the company and, uh, you know, where we're at now with, with suppressors and the new legislation that's hopefully coming down the line and just R and B with suppressors. So, I mean, I had a lot of questions to ask, so hopefully you guys will enjoy that. Maybe hopefully the same questions you kind of have when it comes to suppressors. Um, but hopefully you guys will get some, some really cool information out of this podcast and, and, uh, you know, can run with it. If you're strictly in the market for a, for a suppressor or a new suppressor, want to add to your suppressor lineup, I think there'll be some really good stuff for you there. But before we, uh, before we jump into the podcast, I need to thank the sponsors of this episode, which are Cryptech and Six Hour Optics. Now, Cryptech uh, has been a sponsor of this podcast from the beginning. Um, you know, this past season, I started wearing that new flyaway pattern, and the more and more I see it on film, it's hard, obviously, when you're wearing it to see what it looks like because you can't. Um, but, you know, filming some last stand episodes with it and seeing it on camera, the way it blends into the background, especially a lot of this Midwestern, Western stuff that I hunt, lots of yellow grass, um, grays and tans and things like that. Oh, it, it blends in great. You know, not to say that the Highlander pattern isn't pretty good as well, because I really like it. Um, but I I do really like this this yellowness that's in that flyway pattern. But uh, yeah, you can head over to their website um, and check out that entire flyway pattern. Another thing too, you know, those Wraith over whites, uh, man, you know, unfortunately, I don't know if it's good or bad. I didn't get to wear them as much this coyote season as I did last. You know, last year I damn near wore out a pair um, because I was wearing them for probably two months straight. You know, this year we just didn't have the snow that we normally had. So didn't get to wear them a lot, but man, I'll tell you, I've been I've been wearing snow camel for 20 years and have had you name it I've had it and this is by far my favorite set of snow camel the material just the light weightness of it how easy it just stores away I can slide it up it actually acts as a windbreaker a little bit um you know so it actually holds in a little bit of heat but when it gets warm and you know some days obviously we're hunting in the snow when it's 30 40 degrees I can just put it on you know over a hoodie or a long sleeve t-shirt and it's perfectly warm enough um, comes with a set of gaiters, um, which I just started using for the first time this year. That helped out a lot, you know, getting snow up underneath my pant legs and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, you're in the market for who knows, maybe uh, maybe looking at a new puffy jacket. Um, I hope you guys don't make make as much fun of you wearing puffy jacket as they do of me. But I'll tell you, I love my puffy jacket. It's it's about as warm as they get. But uh, no, maybe you're looking for a new pair of that snow camo uh, set, maybe for the next season. Yeah, check out that Wraith pattern there. You'll you'll absolutely love it. So, like I said, in the market for any new camera, camo pattern, camo clothing, um, anything like that, you can head over to Cryptech.com. Now, Six Hour Optics, when I was out at this Western Hunting Conservation Expo, um, I actually went over to the SIG booth. A buddy of mine had told me about a new, new line of scopes they have that are out now, and it's the Tango DMRs. And supposedly the backstory behind that is, some engineers that were at one of the competitors, um, you know, got cannibalized and and came over to SIG now. So some of that same technology and things that were at a competitor's uh, scope lineup are now in this new Tango DMR lineup. And I'll tell you, I looked at it and I was impressed. Um, what I really liked about it was the fact that uh, the glass maybe is a touch better, but we're back to a dial system on the top instead of the BDX system. And not that the BDX system didn't work, you know, I guess over the last couple, three years of me shooting the BDX system, it was very hard for me to get used to it after shooting a dial system for so many years before, you know, the BDX system is super fast, you know, with the Bluetooth in my rangefinder and the dot would come up on the, on the reticle. The problem I had with it was a coyote is such a small target that when you have a, a coyote out there at four or five, 600 yards, and you're going to try a long range shot, you simply had to move the reticle up and then try to position this red LED dot on center of that coyote which to me it just wasn't always as precise as i was hoping for the great thing about going back to a 
elevation dial that I can just dial in. Now I can use center cross on my crosshairs now and not a, a random dot that comes up down the reticle. So I'm excited about that. They still offer it um, in, in kind of the 6X. I think you can get the, the, the Tango DMR in a 5 to 30. Um, you can also get it um, in a 3 to 18. Now the reticles are a little busy there, but um, according to the rep there, I can get it in just a fine duplex, which is what I shoot as well. So I'm excited about that. Obviously, um, I won't have it till you know later this summer, um, but I'll be shooting it uh, come come the start of next season for sure. So I'll keep you guys filled in on how I'm liking that. But kind of excited to get back to the old dial, and uh, you know, get to maybe planking a few coyotes out there a little bit further. But yeah, you're in the market for one of these new scopes. Maybe we'll look at that uh, you know Sierra Six BDX that I'm running right now. Maybe you need a, a red dot like the Romeo 3 XL that I run on the on a 45 mount on my AR for those close shots um, or just some of those, uh, you know, kilo range find of binoculars, which are freaking crazy good. Um, yeah, head over to SIGOptics.com and you can check out that full lineup there. Well, Brandon, welcome to the podcast, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate you taking the time. It's a unique setting, oh, you know, yeah. being here at the Western Hunting Conservation Expo. Oh, the busiest you know? day, too, for sure. <laughs> Has the booth, Silent Central booth, been busy? Oh, yeah, we were stacked up before it even opened. It must have been vendors, because it was before the show even opened. We were stacked up. Sa Sa this show's crazy on Saturday. I remember last year, I got here on a Saturday morning, and I didn't have a pass. I had a ticket to come through the thing. Yeah. It was like a 45-minute wait. Oh, I believe Trying it. to get into the thing. It's crazy. It's a good it's thing. A, it's, it is good. It's oh, good yeah. to see this many people out supporting this kind of stuff, isn't it? It's awesome. Well, I'm excited. You know, I've been talking about, you know, suppressors is a big part of what I do as a coyote hunter. Um, and then obviously bringing Silencer Central on as a sponsor of the podcast and all of Eastman stuff has been exciting. So I'm excited. It's, it's been, you know, something that I've wanted to get you on here for a long time, or at least somebody from Silencer Central. Yeah. And heck, I get you, you no, know, it's perfect. I'm the, excited. the head honcho. So um, <laughs> this will be exciting. I got lots of cool stuff that I want to talk about, just, you know, suppressors in general. But before we get going, kind of, I always kind of like to get a little background on you. Sure. Um, Kind of maybe not so much hunting, but just kind of how you fell into where you're at right now. Okay, yeah, good question. So, um, you know, I didn't really grow up around firearms that much, to be honest with you. My parents weren't against firearms, but they just, my dad didn't yeah. hunt. So, um, but my grandfather and uncle did, so I always say it was kind of in my gene pool. Um, and then I married a gal from South Dakota. I grew up in the Southeast. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so I was born in Alabama, then Georgia, then mostly North Carolina. So when I married a gal from South Dakota, I realized her family was like huge into firearms. Oh, yeah, I yeah. I mean, they were just like super into it. So I kind of felt like this um, sort of push when I moved to South Dakota, I should probably buy a few firearms, get a little bit more familiar <laughs> with them. and um, you fit in with the crowds, yeah, huh? Yeah, totally. And then I started prairie dog hunting. And oh, in yeah. South Dakota. South Dakota's loaded with prairie dogs. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just, like growing up as a kid, I would shoot rats a little bit, you know, just sort of fooling around with that with a twenty two. And so then to see, like, to drive by these fields and just see the look like the ground's moving yeah, i'm like yeah. all right i'm interested in that how do i so i went to the local gun store and said, what do i need to buy and they set me up and i started shooting them and then um honestly i so i gotta back up prairie, yeah. prairie dogs is cool i love shooting prairie yeah. dogs right yeah so did you ever did you get real serious did you like get the shooting benches oh, out heck yeah or did you totally just like it. when we do it honestly we just drive through the prairie dog towns and we're shooting them out the windows oh, you yeah. know and stuff but oh i've done I mean, that too <laughs> drive, yeah. yeah yeah no i i do like i mean i got the whole table i got everything oh yeah 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 i, I super got into it i mean one thing i didn't mention that it's sort of like weird part of the story is i'm a pharmacist by trade okay so i think nice. i think people it's weird that i would go from like being a pharmacist to like doing just suppressors now yeah yeah but um i did the pharmaceutical industry for about 12 years and then when i moved to south dakota it's kind of hard to get in the pharmaceutical industry because of geography. You know, you're so spread out um, Makes sense, on yeah. the East Coast, more tighter density. Yep. So, um, but got into prairie dog hunting, and I went to a gun show with my father-in-law, and I saw a silencer. It wasn't really for sale. It was more of a display, just on a tactical type setup. And that's when I was like, that kind of looks like that would help me prairie dog hunting. And oh, then yeah. I, I, I found it did help me for prairie dog hunting. And the honest truth is I had a really tough time buying a suppressor at a local gun store. I could just tell it's not their business model. I mean, most gun stores, you come in, they help you get what you need, you leave. Um, this is more back and forth. You know, I sometimes use a weird analogy. I say we're kind of your OBGYN. You're going to talk to us <laughs> yeah, monthly yeah, for nine yeah. months, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so we just create an entire business model around that process. What year was that? When you 2005. 2005. Wow. Yeah. So that, I was good telling you, I got my first press in 2008, and I thought that yeah. was early. That was even before that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But you're right. You know, that old school process, and if, it might even still be around to some people right but yeah you know you'd have to go to the dealer oh, yeah. in, your, in your local state or yep. area yeah they'd have to 
give you the paperwork. They didn't even know much about it. Oh, heck no. no <laughs> I totally. remember having to go down to the chief of police and have to, oh, yeah. what do you need this for, you know? And totally. I'm like, uh, sound suppression? I don't know, you yeah, know? Like, totally. make you feel all guilty wanting a suppressor. Totally. And then come back, and he's, like, trying to read over the paperwork, the gun dealer guy, and he don't even know if it's right. Totally. You know? So it's like, yeah, it was it was a process. Yeah. And, you know, I, after I got my license, it's kind of like my father-in-law had a federal farms license in his pharmacy, so I could see the benefits of, like, having your own license as far as getting ammo and scopes and guns. So I think mentally I thought, well, I might as well just get it and try to get silencers too. But it's pretty expensive. I mean, it's like 1000 bucks a year to have the license to do the silencer. So that's what oh, I was gotcha, like. Yeah. I should probably sell a few. The wife's going to complain if I spend <laughs> 1000 bucks a year just to play with toys. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, that's pretty much how I got in. And that first gun show I worked, I could tell that, Almost everyone in the Dakotas, like you probably down in Nebraska, yeah. they, they varmin hunt. Yeah, yeah. So they were looking for something that was light and quiet, and also they wanted the process easier. And what I found, honestly, back then is most everything on the market was set up for tactical. It was sort of like their goal was hearing safe, and then their, their goal typically was like um, – be able to handle like full auto like their thought was like more of a rugged type sure, situation yeah, yeah. whereas what i found is hunters they wanted as quiet as possible they aren't necessarily as worried about it. they want it to be hearing safe but they want it even quieter than that they want to push those limits but also like a rugged type setup would be like you know heat treated stainless steel or but really the hunter's going to want titanium so it's super lightweight yep. so that's kind of how we created our brand was based on making the process easy making stuff lightweight that was also quiet for hunting and then you know also stuff that you could take apart and clean was a big request just because you could get that trigger time on prairie dogs i mean sometimes i shoot 300 rounds a day so yep. you get dirty up a silencer pretty quick if you're shooting out there <laughs> prairie dog town oh, for yeah. a week yeah <laughs> so it seems like you know, the business model you guys have is genius. I mean, the way, you know, I've talked about it on this podcast a lot about the process and how simple and easy it is. Yeah. What What were some of the barriers to entry to that? Like, like you know, why didn't somebody else do this before? Like, what yeah. what made this a challenge yeah. to, to make this happen? Because now it seems like, wow, how, how come nobody else ever did this? Like, it seems so easy, like, the way yeah. you guys have had the, set this up now. What? Yeah, it's a good question. So... Um, you probably know a little bit about South Dakota, so I would sell silencers in Rapid City. And what I found about South Dakota, I'm not obviously originally from there, but people that are West River, South Dakota, they don't drive East River for nothing. Yeah, East River, West River, oh, yeah, yeah. It's a bad, you know, yeah. it's just sort of a thing in the state. <laughs> so I would sell, I would sell silencers at the Rapid City Gun Show in April, and I would tell the guys, hey, I could do a transfer for you when I come back in April because the ATF considers the gun show to be an extension of your license premises in the same state. But I was like. That's really the only option I have. So guys obviously didn't like that. If they bought one in, you know, April and they got approved, you know, I don't know, say January, then they couldn't pick it up till the next April. Yep. And a lot of them didn't want to drive that far. So I hired an attorney and asked them to help me see if there was a way to mail silencers back and forth, like within the same state where you have a license. And, um, you know, we figured out a way I could, but back then it's interesting because the law did change a little bit. So before, um, a lot of people were doing a, a trust Yep. And if you do a trust, you had to do a background check on one of the people on the trust when they came to pick it up. And so then my current system would not have worked. But now Obama changed it in 2017 where they actually required the FBI to do a background check on everyone on the trust. Ooh. And because everyone on the trust has had a background check, we can mail it to them now. Because basically the statute says if there's no background check required, you don't have to meet face to face. Um, but no, to your point, um, you know, I, I also own a fair amount of machine guns just over the years buying those. And I would read, uh, there was a book called The Machine Gun Dealer Bible. And he talked about the idea of, it's called a non-over-the-counter transfer process. Yeah. So it's basically just not meeting face to face. Yep. Um, but, you know, it continued to evolve a little bit because in South Dakota, our, you guys have a purchase permit in Nebraska. Yep. So I could mail it to my customers in Nebraska directly at their front door year, for forever, ever since I had a license in Nebraska, which has been a long time. But South Dakota, I had to spend many years getting our concealed carry permit where it was NICS exempt so there was no background check. Good. Because then if you had a concealed carry in South Dakota and you bought a silencer, no matter where you lived in the state, I could mail it to your front door because there's no background check required on states that have concealed carries that are NICS exempt. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, I really like dove into it deep and you know spent a ton of money trying to get the laws changed in my state and then sort of focused on other states that already had that law in place so I could benefit from it. And then when the law changed, I benefited more from it. But the interesting thing for me is um, Stephen Halberg, to me, he's like the world-renowned guru for legal, and he's a guy I use quite a bit when I want to submit a letter to the ATF and get their attention because he's done several cases before the Supreme Court and won several cases that were specific to firearms. Wow. And he wrote a book the other day, and I, I, I saw him at a show, and I said, hey, if I, if I give you a free silencer, will you sign, my, <laughs> si sign a book and send it to me? And he goes, yeah. dude, I'm, you don't have to give me a free silencer, but I'm going to mail you a book. Yeah. But in the book, he gave me a very good compliment, at least I thought. He said, you know, Brandon created a business model 
based on a statute that was hidden in plain sight. I mean, it's in the Gun Control Act. Anyone could have done it. So he's always kind of tips his hat to me because he's the brain of everything sort of gun related and history of firearms and all the legal stuff. He's the guru. And for him to say, hey, this yeah, is yeah. brilliant. You created no a business model on something that everyone thought was hidden, but it was available right there. In yeah, the, yeah. You know, but the hard part is implementing it because everyone always says, you know, Years ago, like the way the statute's written, it says you have to use a specific form to do this process. So that's what sort of started my discussion with ATF was this form is no longer in print. So if it's no longer in print, you got to tell me what you want me to do. Do you want me to use the regular 4473 everyone else is using, or do you want to start printing that form? And that's when they, they brought, they created a process for me to use the current form and do the process the statute allows. And at that time it was called a variance and it was just for me. I was the only person in the country that had that variance because I had the first person to request it. But over time, it became a ruling, and it's a ruling now where everyone can do it. Okay. But if you read through what has to be done, it is, it's tough. For a local dealer to have to go through that whole process that yeah. we go through, it's tough. The only reason it's easy for us is because we've done you know, a couple hundred thousand a year. I mean, yeah, just yeah. we've gotten good. I yeah, mean, it, yeah. it, it, is, it is tough. Like, we have to send a certified copy of your 4473 to your sheriff. We have to have proof they signed for it. You know, we have to wait seven days after they sign for it before we can deliver it. I mean, there's a lot of like legal stuff we have to do, so it's not as easy as just mailing it to their front door. I yeah. mean, for the consumer it is, it is so yeah. it's super easy. We just mail it to their front door, but well, on the I've back end, stuff. we're doing a lot yeah, of yeah. stuff, and we've worked with the ATF a lot of years to sort of fine tune what they want, how they want it, how do we can do it digitally, so we also have ways we could do things digitally that the statutes don't really allow for, but we just went to them and asked them and created a process that they agreed to that we could do every our entire process digitally. With this, with the NFA, you know, do you think that's ever something that's going to go away? You Good think question. So I get that asked a lot. So my prediction the last week when someone asked me was, I think seven to ten years it goes away. The hard part is you really have to have. So my lobbyist says we'll need at least six years of a Republican Senate, House, and presidency. So at some point, you need all those in there for six years to be able to educate them. But my theory is that more and more people buy suppressors because if you look at the growth of this market, it just keeps going up. So the more and more people that own them, that's just more voters out yep. there. And then if you look at even some of the recent court cases where they say it's in common use, even if there's a couple hundred thousand of them being used, um, then I think there's a, a play there from a legal perspective. Because right now there's probably about four million silencers in civilian hands. And so at some point they're gonna say, hey, how, how could this not be protected underneath the Second yeah, Amendment? And you yeah. can't fur further regulate it the way you do through the NFA process. Because the M NFA has been around, what, 30s? 34, yep. yep what, and, and it came about, I, I watched a, a, a little documentary on it one. It wasn't a 15 minute deal on it. And it was, some, was it right after the Great Depression in that era? Where is that kind of where it came about? Like. Yeah, so guys were using suppressors to go out and shoot guys' cattle and stuff, so they're like, we got to regulate this somehow. Is there, is there any truth behind that? Or You know, I so again, I, I asked, asked this Dr. Stephen Halbert um, out of Alexandria, Virginia, his perspective, because he's he's written papers on it and done yeah, research, because yeah. I figure he's the guy. So, here, so here's his communication to me. So he said originally handguns were in the NFA process. Really? But this was right after uh, Prohibition. Prohibition. So yeah. basically they said... Um, you know, Americans just now getting their rights back to drink. They can't handle us taking their handguns. So the, the theory was there was sort of a, hey, we'll, we'll take handguns out and we'll trade it for silencers. And my sort of perception is there was no one at the table to be an advocate for silencers. Yeah. So they probably said, hey, we don't want handguns. Let's just put, how about silencers? And there's probably no one at the table go, oh, what are you thinking? And they got put in there and they've just stayed in there. Because I think, I think deep down, I mean, ATF is obviously tasked with enforcing the laws that Congress creates, so their hands are tied. But when you talk to them, sort of what I would call offline, they don't see this as a public safety issue. If I ever, because I have a Google alert, so anything with the word silencer or suppressor, I get an email 24 hours a day. So I read them all day long. So I get anything that's anything that's indexed by Google that has yeah. those words in it, yep. I read it every day. And um, Anytime you read an article about a criminal case with a suppressor or silencer, 100% of the time they were made homemade. They're yeah. typically a felon that, you know, could not have gone through the process and they made their own. So the, the law enforcement feels like there's no public safety issue, which I think helps us too. Oh, That's, for sure. When you tell people there's not a public safety issue and right now there's a tough process to get them, people's blood pressure that go down that are in sort of that <laughs> gun control world. But I think eventually as more people own them and they see it's less of a public safety issue, I think that hopefully it goes away. You know, I think NFA may stay in place for like short barrel rifles, machine guns, other stuff like that. But I could see silencers getting sort of reclassified as like, a, you know, just a regular, say, handgun or long gun. Now, that was a $200 tax stamp 
back even in 1934, yes, right? Yes, like that. Yes. What was that equivalent to, like money wise, back in 1934? You know, like like 3,500 bucks. But yeah. So the goal was to be 100% tax on a machine gun. So that's what a machine gun cost in 1934. So the goal was to be 100% tax. So during the Obama administration, the ATF told me he came to them and said, "Hey, could we not scale this $200 up based on inflation?" They said, "No, statutes <laughs> don't allow for that." You know? <laughs> <laughs> scale it. Yeah. Holy that would have hurt sales. Yeah. No kidding. Oh. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, it's it's funny, you know, the the Hollywood perception of, of suppressors and silencers and you know, it's yeah. it's something that like if anybody that's ever been around him, you're like, holy crap. Totally. You know, my circle of friends, you know, I was the first one to have them. You were probably the first one around your oh, guys yeah. that's having them, totally. and they're like, everybody's kind of like, wow, you know, grumbling about it, and then they around it, and they're like, holy cow. Now everybody I've ever been around has one. You know, it's kind of one of those deals. Totally, hundred percent. Now over in Europe, I, in your is it true that like in Europe, like they almost require suppressors on some stuff, like. Yeah, you know, over the counter kind of stuff. You can just buy them South South Africa, places totally. like that. Yeah, totally. So you know, it's a little bit obviously a different market. So they're not as highly regulated. But here's what I always say: like when I go to Europe or South Africa, it's impossible to get a firearm. So it's easy to buy the silencer, but it's impossible to get the yeah. gun. So my daughter used to do a lot of Irish dance. We'd go over there a fair amount into, you know, sort of those countries, Great Britain, and um, they just. It's the, the, like people always tell you, you'll never see a gun unless it's with a police officer. It's almost impossible to own one. And then in South Africa, typically you can only have one gun of one caliber. So you can only own one 308. You can only own one 300 wind mag. You can only own one 223. And after that, you pretty much, I don't know how you get rid of your old one to try to yeah, upgrade yeah. a new one. But, you know, the, the, the reason why the market's also different there is you typically see their aluminum and they see them more as disposable. Because what I would say you see in America is like we create trust and like someone will come to Silencer Central and buy a titanium silencer from us. And it'll almost be an heirloom because of the trust. They'll give it down to a son, yep. grandson. Yep. Whereas over in the other countries, they're typically um, big, fat, aluminum. You know, they don't take the, they don't cost that much to make because then yeah, they yeah. just throw them away and get another one. So there's less there's less idea of let's maintain it and clean it and keep it like new. There's more of a well, when I wear it out, I'll just buy another one. Huh. Is there legislation? I'd also heard something about legislation in place that potentially, if, if this all passed, like the $200 tax stamp, that money would go towards some sort of conservation. Yes. And, it, and then if the ATF was able to process permits, you know, under a certain amount of time, the ATF would actually get that money. And if yeah. they, if it is, have you, is that any truth behind that? Yeah, so I'm curious where you heard about that. So that's actually a bill that um, I hired a lobbyist a lot of money to put in play. So he, I'm not going to take credit for it. He had the idea. What I communicated to him is right now that $200 tax, 100% of that money goes into the U.S. Treasury. So they can spend it anywhere they want. Yep. Um, so I feel like that that's sort of a deterrent to some customers to want to buy a suppressor if they feel like it just goes to the government yep. for whatever. Yep. So what we came up with is that 85% of the money, that $200 tax stamp, would go into conservation. So the Pittman-Robertson, which is already in place for ammunition, rifles, pistols, yep. it's there's already a system in place, been in place since 39. So same process, the 85% of that $200 tax stamp would go to that. The other 15% would go to the ATF, and the ATF would use that to hire more people to process the forms and to create more infrastructure from a technology perspective. But here's the catch. So silencers would automatically be, be approved in 90 days because the theory is they've always said they want to approve them in 90 days. So what we say is if we start giving you multi-million dollar additional funds that you don't have now, don't you think you could do it in 90 days? Now, of course, they don't respond, but I, I think that deep down they probably thought, gosh, if we could get an extra 20 or 30 million dollars a year, yeah, we could probably process as many silencers as you want to send us in 90 days. Because, see, the, the downside, if you go buy a handgun at your local dealer in Nebraska, within three days the FBI has to give them a yes or no answer. And then if they don't, then you can leave with that handgun. It, you know, it's up to the dealer, but typically dealers let it go if the ATF doesn't get a response back <laughs> from the FBI. With silencers, there's no such statute. So in other words, when it goes in to get a background check, if they can't determine whether you can legally own it or not, they'll send me a letter back and they'll call it a return without action. Now, it doesn't happen often, but we're trying to find that statute of like says 90 days after 90 days, if you've done a background check and you can't figure out where they, whether they can own it or not, the dealer can transfer it. Because again, that's the way it works with a handgun now. So a lot of people may not even realize that they may know that when they go to buy a handgun, they get delayed and they got to come back in yeah, a few yeah. days. Um, typically what's happened is they've probably been charged with something and then the courts never really wrote down what, what it ended with. So maybe you're charged with X, but then no one ever said, well, it ended with Y. And because X could have been something that made you a prohibited person, they don't know. 
and then the, F the FBI never really gives a response to the dealer, so then the dealer's allowed to transfer it after th you know three days. Yeah, so yeah. we're trying to create the same kind of statute around silencers that after 90 days, it's approved. Because right now, if, you, if I apply for a federal firearms license, and again, we have them in 40, 42 states, so if we apply for a license, the ATF has 60 days to tell us yes or no. If I change my address, they have 30 days to respond. So we're trying to create, hey, if I buy a silencer, you got 90 days to tell me yes or no. We just want it to be in writing. Because the other problem is, the FBI is hired really to do all these dealer processing of background checks because they know they have three days to respond. Right now, silencers on the back burner. They only work to silencers when time allows, which rarely does because gun sales have been so big in the last you know, 10 yeah. years. So if we could force them to say you got 90 days to respond, I think they would staff up on the FBI side as well. And then, so, okay. so the bigger yeah. strategy of this $200 tax stamp. So, a lot of that Pittman Robertson conservation money goes down to the state level and a lot of state agencies, you know, game fish and parks are funded with this. Mm -hmm. Our theory is that if a lot of states start getting money from silencer sales, they'll be less likely to ban them. So it's sort of a Very long true, yeah. it's sort of a long term approach. I mean if you look at how many states are we looking at right now that still ban them? Uh, eight. Eight. Yeah. So that's what, 42? There you yeah. go. Yeah. And so right now we still have in that legislation where they get that funding too because we thought if we take California and some of these bigger states, Illinois, Massachusetts, if we take those people off the table, then we would lose the congressional support. True. So at some point it would be nice to say, hey, we'll apportion out the money of conservation based on how many sell in your state. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah. And then if, there's, if they're not legal, then you're not getting <laughs> anything, you know? <laughs> Heck, yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. <clears throat> you know, this – the wait times, you know, when you talk to anybody about getting a suppressor, that's yeah. the number one topic, totally. right? Uh, wait. Yeah. So I, I, I just picture like the office at the ATF, right? I mean, is it is it simply just a lack of manpower? Is that why it takes? I mean, you're talking about passing a background check for a pistol in three yeah. days. Oh, yeah, totally. So is it it's just yeah. that? It's just yeah. they have yeah, two so guys in there looking at thousands of four. I mean, is that what, really what it is there? Or? Yeah, you know, and I hate – and I. The sad part is I feel like I know them pretty well. I mean, they come visit us quite a bit. We invite yeah. them just to show them our operation. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're the biggest deal in the country. We're, we're pushing a lot of, you know, paperwork to them. So um, I would say that, like, if you got them off somewhere where you could just get them a talk, they would tell you that their infrastructure is horrible. They don't – I mean, they got old computers. They don't have new software. Um, they probably get low-quality employees. Like, the people that examine these are the lowest-paid federal employees in the state of West Virginia. So once someone gets into the system as a federal employee, they typically jump to something else. Oh, gotcha. So this becomes a jumping stone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just I, I don't think that they probably have good uh, people management leadership, meaning somebody with, like, an MBA background training or, you know, someone that understands organizational structure and yeah, yeah. someone that looks at efficiency and looks at bottlenecks and things like that. I mean, recently I've seen them start batching suppressors. So if I have a customer that's bought – say one in May, one in June, one in July, one in August, when they go to approve one, they'll approve them all. And the reason why is ATF has to pay FBI to do that background check. So to save money, they'll just approve them all at once. That would make yeah. sense because yeah. it's more efficient. So they're doing small things like that. I do think the biggest bottleneck is, is the employees. They don't have enough. They, they're going to probably do six to 700,000 um, applications this year, and I think they have like 30 employees that no do that. No kidding. And I always say, I mean, my sister's a federal attorney, so I get it. They, they probably have, you know, 30, 40 days off a year where, you know, <laughs> yeah, they don't yeah. have to work. So, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's eight to five, and I don't know. It's got to be a horrible job, too, sitting there looking <laughs> yeah, at these oh applications God, yeah. all day long. It's, <laughs> It's yeah, I always just, I would, yeah, just always picture it because that's the number one complaint, you know. Totally. And it's just like, yeah, you just kind of wonder. It's so, so one thing we did, and of course this doesn't help the wait, but what we tell guys is, hey, listen, we'll let you pay while you wait. So we want this thing approved as quick as you do because I have to pay insurance on yeah, it while it's sitting there. Yeah. And so I say, hey, you know, no interest, no fees. You just pay me while you wait. And guys like that because I always say the wife doesn't like you buying something you don't get. Yeah, yeah. So why don't yeah. you just pay me 100 bucks a month? And then when it's approved, we'll ship it to your front door. And I always say, if you that's don't pay awesome. me, I'm not going to ship it. So just take as long as you want to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So walk me through R and D of a of a suppressor. I mean, yeah. you started back tw two thousand five. Yeah. I mean, you've developed the Banish line now. Yeah. Yep. Um, so how how's that even work? Like w when you start talking about internal chambers and length, yeah. and I mean, yeah, like right. Walk me through the process. Yeah, that's a good question. So. You know, I would say my first evolution into this is we did basically white labeling. So I hired other people that had suppressors, and I just said, "Hey, can you put my name on it?" And then as I got. Um, you know, the first ones that we had our name on were monolithic, which I'm not a big fan of. Uh, typically, I found them to be louder, and uh, you typically explain got what that means. Yeah, monolithic. Sure, good question. So basically, you know, they're not as popular now. I've seen, um, you know, 
most people have shied away from a monolithic silencer, but basically a monolithic silencer is one piece that's been machined out and then you're sliding a tube over it and you're basically making a sign. It's basically a two piece silencer. Okay. It's the outer tube and then it's the insert. And I think the theory was, well, if the insert, you know, goes, goes bad, you could replace the insert and still have the tube. Because your is, serial number's yes, on the tube. Yes, right? the serialized yep. component is the outside tube. Um, you know, that was the first one. And what I found is they had to keep making them longer to be able to handle magnums and they had a first round pop. So first round pop is usually you have too much open air inside the silencer that's cold. So that first shot is really loud. And I always say if you're a hunter, you don't want your first shot to be the loudest. Yeah, yeah. That's like the yeah. worst thing. Damn right. You hate to have to shoot a couple times to heat it up so it's quieter. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was our first um, design that we went with another company to make. And then I kind of went to them and said, hey, I would like to look at stacked baffles because those are typically more efficient. And you know, they weren't really interested in that. So what I did is I went and tested every silencer on the market. I found some that were super quiet, that were stacked baffles. Then I hired a company out of uh, Sturgis, South Dakota, actually, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. the Mack Brothers, and sat down with them and said, hey, here's the quietest silencers on the market I've been able to find. I want you to make them all titanium so they're lighter. I want you to make them come apart and clean because most hunters uh, want to be able to take it apart and get the carbon out. And then I want you to make them as quiet or quieter than this. So I have to say my first R&D was pretty simple. It's basically pay someone else to go figure it out. And they did a great <laughs> job. And I love those guys. Yeah, They've been great yeah. to work with. But since then, now we have internal engineering departments. The most recent silencer we came out with is a little bit different. It's for law enforcement. And what happened there was um, Federal Ammunition, the guys that own Remington and Vista Outdoors, they came to us and said, hey, we see the silencer market growing with law enforcement. They said, we sell, you know, we have really good market share and great access with the law enforcement agencies with ammo. We'd like to also sell them suppressors. So about two and a half years ago, they came to us and asked them to design a silencer specifically for them. And this design is actually 3D printed. And it's a different market than hunting. At first, I was almost like hesitant to um, go down that route of doing a law enforcement can because I feel like it's so different than hunting. Um, but like uh, uh, the, the law enforcement can, their goal is typically they want less blowback so typically it's going to be louder so for me it doesn't make sense to have a louder silencer yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. if you're hunting but for law enforcement they wanted it to be as uh, less blowback and they also wanted it to be more rugged where it can handle like say full auto um, so that silencer we created for them has worked out really well because it has less blowback but also it can handle full auto so that's 3D printed. Yeah. Huh. yeah. That's interesting. Now that's that shorter fat one. Yeah, we right? call it, yeah, our internal name for it's two by four. Dude, the two by four, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like two inch diameter, four inches wide. Yeah, but yeah. so the R and D on that one was kind of listening to the customer, figure out what they wanted. We got some ports on the outside so that the gas can flow through a little bit easier. It's still quiet, it's hearing safe, it's more set up for kind of a full auto scenario. But you know, the the, the newest one we came up before that was called the backcountry, which honestly that's our hottest seller here. Yeah. So people love the banished backcountry because it's so light. You know, it's lighter than your cell phone. Yeah. I wrote an article today. Goes, actually, I weighed my cell phone. It's lighter than my cell phone. So, you know, that one. You know, what we found is we found a design where we just put a lot of baffles in there, and then we we hired a, a defense contractor that had a robot welder. That's really they're really used to um, doing welds on titanium, which is not very easy. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, a lot of people in the industry lately have had um, recalls on their welds on titanium for silencers. And fortunately, Silencer Central, we haven't had any underneath the banish line. I think it's because we've outsourced it to defense contractors. That that's all they ever do, have done is weld titanium. But that backcountry at five and a half inches and 7.8 ounces is it's it's a huge win. It's hearing safe on a Remington Ultramag, which is I as you know that's a pretty high yeah, round. Yeah, yeah. So that everyone loves that here for hunting, and I would say that's our number one seller for the events we work because most events we work are outdoor events, sportsmen's events, yep, yep. hunting events. So that one's been really popular. But. Um, to be honest with you, typically um, the Mac Brothers convinced me it's a lot of trial and error. So what I would do is we just went out <laughs> yeah. and spent you know seventy thousand dollars on this meter. And the good thing about these meters is is it can read that rise rate, like you hear that that shot blast go up, it'll read that. And then um, basically we just test everything on the market. And if something tests really well, it's like let's take it apart, let's figure out what they did, and let's try to figure out and make something similar or just as good. It's almost like always challenging yourself to create a new benchmark. And yeah. I do think that. Um, you know, obviously I'm biased, but I think the hunters should demand something as quiet as possible because it's easy for people to say, well, this is a can for hunting or whatever. But the question is, how quiet is it? Because my experience, the hunters want it as quiet as possible because then it doesn't scare the game. It's easier to hear the shot when you hit them and you know it's a kill shot. I mean, there's so many advantages for it to being as quiet as possible. So and also lightweight. I mean, so, and I, I hate to like 
I don't think t that the aluminum is a good idea. I'm a titanium guy. Yeah. I mean, of course, I'm buying $10 million worth of titanium a year, <laughs> yeah. so I can buy it for probably as cheap as people are buying aluminum in the U.S. Yeah, but yeah. anytime people hear, you know, aluminum and a hunting can, I always say, gosh, just pay a little extra and get a titanium one because it's going to last longer and you don't have to worry about it, you know, blowing loose or, you know, cracking over time. And So it's a lot about finding, I guess, it seems to me like the balance is size and chambers obviously equal more sound suppression, but we don't want the thing looking like a two-liter bottle on the end of your totally. gun, right? So yeah, it's totally. trying to find that right balance of, okay, we don't want it so big, but hey, if we make it maybe just a little bit bigger here, it'll yeah, it gives us extra chambers. Is, is that kind of yeah, to capture and, sound? Or is there? And you know, it's funny because like I mean, I have engineers. That's all they've been doing for you know six or seven years, and even they will test. Like we'll have like maybe twenty versions. We'll create one that has the blast chamber. You'll look at it, you'll be like. That blast chamber, that's like three fourths of the silence, and that'll never work. And it might be really quiet. Like yeah. it's just really weird. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you'll try something, you're like, wow, I would have never guessed that would work, but yeah. it did. Um, and then if you look at our um, new law enforcement cam, we've got like fins on the inside of it, and for some reason that helps with uh, flash really? and also makes it quieter. Acts as a baffle. It's really cool. <laughs> like weird stuff you would never think yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of it is just sort of a trial and error, but I do agree it's 100% balance between what I've seen now is there's more of getting a little bit fatter so that you get a little bit more volume in there and then you can sort of reduce your length. Because when I first started doing this, the diameter typically for a rimfire was an inch and then for a 30 cal and a 223 cal was typically an inch and a half. Mm -hmm. Now you see like we're going up to an inch and you know 1.6 or 1.62 or 1.65 and you're able to make up more volume in there and then just put more baffles. So. Yeah, it's been it's been fun to watch. I mean, I always say, um, you know, try to get something lightweight. Try to get something you can take apart and clean. Try to get something that's quiet. Um, those are, in my mind, those are the most things people think about. I think other manufacturers will create issues. Like, you'll hear people say, "Hey, I want something that has less point of impact change." But my experience is, once you put a silencer on there and you sight it in, it's gonna stay, and you're gonna have consistent yeah. shot. It might be different, obviously, than when you didn't have the silencer on there, but to me that almost doesn't matter. Once you put the silencer on and you sight it in and it stays the same, that's all you want anyway. What is the science behind that? But, you know, you know when you screw a suppressor onto your yeah, barrel, yeah. and obviously, yeah, if you have it sighted in without the suppressor and you screw it on there, more than likely your point impact is going to change. Oh, heck yeah. so I've seen some where it stays pretty close. Other, yeah. it's like six, eight, nine inches. Totally. Yeah, but totally. then, yeah, once you get it on and shoot, you're good. Yeah. But what... Is it does it change the harmonics with the barrel yeah. or something like that? Even yeah. muzzle velocities are even different. It'll speed it up a little yeah. bit, which is yeah. nice. Yeah. So it's typically barrel harmonics will change, but also typically you'll see less recoils and less jump. So you're typically gonna shoot a little bit low. So most times when I have to reside it, you know, the barrel is jumping a little bit higher because it didn't have anything on the end. So really having that extra weight on the end will typically make it shoot a little bit lower. But once you sight it in and you've got it sighted in right, as long as you're always shooting with that silencer, then it's gonna be perfect. Yeah, yeah. So as a consumer looking at this stuff, I get lots of questions. Guys ask me, hey, you've been around a lot of suppressors. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I've been around a lot. They, to totally. me, a suppressor is similarly a suppressor, right? Sure. It's, it's doing its job. Yeah. But what, what do guys look, look at when they're saying, okay, if I'm comparing suppressor A to suppressor B, yeah. um, you know, they give the specs, the length, the weight. Is that, is that any indication of sound suppression basis or... What should guys be looking at if they're trying to compare, let's say they want a banished gold or just yeah. a banished backcountry or, yeah. uh, you know, another manufacturer of some kind. Yeah. They're comparing different things. Totally. How do they go about comparing so that they're comparing apples to apples and trying to figure out which is yeah. the best fit for them? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, my experience honestly still is almost every manufacturer of silencers promotes to a tactical audience. And the reason why I say that is if you look at where they advertise, Recoil Magazine or stuff like that, they're going for the tactical market, which is fine. But I think a lot of guys think that it's transferable, and it, and it can be. But I would say, hey, don't, don't sort of like pigeonhole yourself just into tactical because that's what you see the most of. Challenge yourself to look at is there other stuff that's made for hunting. And look, I, you know... Again, I think most people when they come to me, like at these shows, we hand someone different silencers and 100% of the time they want something that's titanium. Mm -hmm. And I would say a lot of times they like short just for hunting. Yeah. Like I was saying like that backcountry is, is, and I've seen newer cans coming out to try to match that demand too. 
lighter weight and also shorter. So I think that's kind of where the market's headed. But to your question, you know, the hard part is like, you know, Thunder Beast does a really good job in my mind doing testing and also creating transparency around their brand and what their actual readings are. You know, there's some uh, third parties out there that have sort of their own kind of black box where they look at different sound testing. I came uh, across a website, Pew Science. Oh, yes. Okay. Is, a lot is of that a good website? It. You know, I do like him. I think he does a really good job. I think what I have trouble with him is that he... He has what I would call part of his black box that he won't reveal to people what it is. Oh, you got to pay for it? Well, you know, and we don't mind paying. I've paid a guy a ton of money to research my stuff. But the problem is, like, to me, like I told you earlier, I'm a pharmacist. So to me, like, I used to look at clinical trials when I was in the pharmaceutical industry. It has to be repeatable. So when he won't tell you what what he's using to assess something, it just makes you skeptical because then it's not repeatable. But one thing he looks at is, and he sort of part of his black box is, um, the intensity of the sound and the impact it might have on hearing damage, but when I read articles from sort of the experts, they say that that's not necessarily the case, that whatever that uh, sort of area he's looking at is not necessarily 100% analogous to where it, it seems like it would be, but it's yeah. not, yeah. so it creates a doubt for me. I still think decibel level is a good thing to look at, and most people I feel like are pretty honest on their decibel level. If they aren't giving you decibel levels, it's, it could be a you know an issue, but I think most people, if you just call them and say, hey, what are your decibel ratings on this? So. The first thing I would look for is lightweight, then I would look for something that's short, and then I would try to look at decibel ratings. And then think about what you're actually gonna shoot it on. So if they're telling you a decibel rating on, say, a 300 Win Mag, but you're gonna be using a 22250 on coyotes, then it doesn't really make sense. Ask them for something analogous to what you're gonna use. So I, the first suppressor I ever got was a 30 cal. Yep. Shot on an AR-15. You know what kind? Yep, a Gem Tech Sandstorm. Sure. Yeah, yeah, Titanium, yeah. Yeah, sealed. Think, you know, all there's a monolithic now, so I don't know if they still do monolithic yep. or not. Um, I probably have 20,000 rounds to the suppressor, you know, yeah, yeah, crazy. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, you know, I, I always thought early on, I'm like, I'm going to get a 30 cal. Yeah. And then I can shoot it on every one of my guns, yep. you know, because at the time when you buy one, you don't always have plans to buy more. You end up totally. usually doing it. Right. right? Yeah, but, yeah, totally, yeah. but, you know, so have you guys found any, because I get this question a lot. Do you, do you get any added sound suppression or less sound suppression shooting a smaller caliber through one of these 30 cal bigger suppressors. Yeah, good question. So I'm guessing that that sandstorm is probably uh, stainless steel, right? T- it's a titanium oh, one. It's titanium. Yep. Good, yep. good, good. Okay, so years ago, no one would ever think about using a 30 cal silencer on a 223 because they were all stainless steel and they were too heavy. But now that a lot of people are using more titanium, it makes sense to think about that. Now, the honest truth is, it is going to be quieter, say that 22250 or 223, to get a can specific to it. Typically, it's going to be quieter, especially on a bolt action. But you only lose a couple decibels by using a 30 cal. So when a guy, like you said, if he comes to the booth and he's like, hey, I can cover my 223 and my 308 and my 300 blackout with one silencer and it's this light, I'm in. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, if you only lose a decibel or two by using a 30 cal silencer on a 223, most guys are like, I'm in. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, if it's your fourth, fifth, sixth silencer and you say, hey, I want something dedicated to my 223 or my 22250 or my 65, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad idea to get one specific for that caliber. Yeah. Yeah, because I also ha- the the one I got the year later was the the twenty two cal the Trek T I yeah. think is what they called yeah, yeah, it back yeah. then, and it was like half the size. So oh, yeah. and that was always the debate back then. Yeah. Man, do you want that big heavy sucker totally. on there? That little the dink, you yeah. know. So no, that's interesting. You know, another thing I come across. You've mentioned it several. The sealed yeah. suppressors versus yeah. being able to take it apart. Right. You know. This banished gold I have now is the first suppressor I've ever had that I can take apart. Oh, yeah. So I don't and even know what to do quiet, with myself. Too. I didn't you I, had the gold. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't even know what to do with point. myself because I've had yeah. these suppressors yeah. and I've dunked them in CLR, you know, yeah. overnight and said, you know, I don't know. I've never, to me, from my, I've never put it up against a decibel reader over the years to see right. if it's getting worse, yeah. you know, filling up with carbon and things like that. But it seems like now a lot of guys are wanting to go with these ones where they can take it apart. Absolutely. What's, what's, what's the, the research and, and stuff that you've said as far as taking being able to take it apart, yeah. clean it? Right. So I would say like just working the shows for like almost 20 years, about 40% of people want to take it apart and clean it. So if they can't, they see that as a negative. Is that the, just the nature of wanting to clean guns? Like I think so. Yeah. It's yeah. just and they want to see inside too. They want to make sure nothing's messed up. Yeah, yeah. Because in their mind, all right, I'm sending a bullet through here, so I want to make sure I can see what it looks like inside. Yeah. Um, so you know, I always say if 40% of any customer wants something, then why not create it for them? And yeah. I also wonder why more people don't make them that come apart to clean because it. A lot of people like that. I mean, and I hear my sales guys talk to people about it, and they'll be like, yep, yeah, I want that one. I can take it apart and clean it. Yeah. The other thing with you've probably seen with the gold is all those baffles are the same, so you can put them in any order. Mm-hmm. Um, people often worry about no matter what silencer you have, if that first baffle gets too much of that you know, blast and the unburnt powder, and over time it's going to wear down. 
that's the concern. But if you have one that comes apart to clean and all the baffles are the same, you could always you rotate, could rotate the order. Them, right? yeah. Yeah. And I always say just by random chance, if you got nine baffles, whatever order you put them back in is not the same order you did last time because they're all the same. So mm-hmm. you're getting if you thought you were getting more wear on the first baffle, the first baffle is now the last baffle or the middle baffle, and then it just it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, all of our baffles are warranty forever. If someone had a problem, but I just think in people's heads they like the idea oh, of being able sure. to rotate yeah. them. Yeah. Um, you know, we do weigh silencers, so we did a lot of testing with that new law enforcement can just because, um, you know, the partnership was with Federal, so they, we bought like 30,000 rounds of ammo just to push through these, and we yeah. would weigh them, and we found that they, it does add a fair amount of weight to a silencer over time with a buildup of lead and carbon in there when you use a lot of rounds. Um, also, we've seen, too, that it can reduce the um, volume inside the suppressor because you're building up carbon. Yeah, makes sense. And then it ends up getting louder. Yeah. So the ability to be able to take it apart is great. Um, and then also you can look at it and sort of examine it and see, hey, am I having a baffle strike? Because, you know, what I found early on when we first started doing this is most baffle strikes are from a poorly threaded barrel. And um, you may not even realize you're getting it, but sometimes you might get bullets that you can't shoot you're a tiger. bullet's just nicking one of the, the yes, baffles yes. in there, just barely nicking it. Totally. Kinda, yeah. And once you take it apart, look at it, you're like, because sometimes I'll hear people call and say, hey, you know, I think I might have a baffle strike. I can see it nicking in there or something. And that's like, yep, send your barrel in. we got to make sure it's threaded properly because usually that's the issue. But yeah, yeah. they may not be able to know that unless they could, you know, take it apart, clean it, look at Makes it, sense, see what's yeah. going on inside. <laughs> um, so my opinion, you can keep it cleaner if you're able to take it apart and make it keep it quieter, really. Um, and again, there's a lot of people that want to be able to take them apart, so it kind of satisfies that need for them. Yeah. Um, I would say just be careful, like putting the tube in any kind of thing. Like the baffles, it's perfect to put in a cleaner because that titanium, they're good forever. Put them in a tumbler. You can put them in a sonic cleaner. That's perfect. Just worry about the, t- the tube. You know, if you needed it recerakoted, just send it back to us. We'll recerakote it. But um, that's the only concern with some of those you can't take apart. If you just throw the whole thing in a sonic cleaner or if you send it in a yeah. seal R bath, that acid can eat the outside of the, um, the tube off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm terrible at cleaning rifles. Like, I even hate to clean my rifles, so you probably, I'm not, <laughs> I'm going to probably put this banished gold to the test as far yeah. as how many rounds I'm going to shoot through it before I actually clean it. So. <laughs> you know, and again, I didn't know you had the gold, but that literally, that's like the quietest silencer on the market. I mean, that yeah. thing is, so I, I tested every silencer on the market. This has been a while back, but I tested every mark, every silencer on the market. There was one out there that was quieter than mine. I called this company up and said, I want you to make one that's 100% titanium. I want you to make one that comes apart to clean. And uh, we're going to call it the gold, and you're going to make it for me. And that's how it started. And it, 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 it's done really well. Yeah, yeah. Another another question about suppressors I get is the QD, quick detach, yeah. versus thread on. Yeah. You know, when I first got into this, I was like, well, you got to get your barrel threaded anyway, right? So my always my thought was like, well, why? Do, why? It seems like an extra step in there to have the QD because you got to thread that QD onto your barrel already. Yep. And then the suppressor you know, locks onto the QD, threads onto the QD. Yep. What's what's kind of the thought process behind deciding, it seems like nowadays most things are going more towards the QD direction, yes. not so much the thread on anymore. What's what's that thought process behind yeah. uh, some of the, the thinking there? So, of course, I'll tell you I'm biased. I find direct thread is more accurate. Just my experience, direct thread on there is more accurate. You know, and I guess this is from years ago, but I used to go test all the silencers. And what I would find is um, a lot of them would shoot off. Like, people would think they had the QD put on correctly, but they didn't. And they would just disengage and shoot off. So I always feel like a direct thread is idiot proof. Um, And also you get, you seem to get better accuracy with direct thread than you do with a QD. Because sometimes the QDs are click, 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 click. It can stop at a different spot each time. So, I mean... To me, the, the companies are pushing QDs because they make money on them. It's sort of like they want someone to buy you know, $100 ad- adapter to put on every rifle so that then they can quick detach. But if you think about a quick detach, it's only, it's still, you know, it's, it's probably five turns instead of putting a silencer on with 10 yeah, or something yeah, like yeah. that. So it's to not me, saving a bunch of time. You know, and, and, you know, we do get, so years ago when we sold silencers, most people didn't own one. But now you talk to a lot of people, they already own one, and they've already got some of these quick detaches. So then we've tried to work on how do we make our silencers um, that we make in-house. Plus, you know, as a dealer, we sell anything. So if someone needs a silencer of any kind, we can sell it to them. It's just that the Banish, traditionally, we've always said, hey, direct that's the best. Most of our customers are hunters. But now as people own other suppressors and they have those adapters, they want to be able to accommodate the ones they've already got. 
So it used to be in the old days, you know, you'd buy a cell phone and every time they had a different plug. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. You, you basically are like, well, I better stick with Samsung or whatever because I've got the same plug. And then, you know, you stuck with the same one. Same theory in my mind happens with the silencers. They want to get you hooked on their mounts so that then you have to buy their silencer next time. And then you're kind of already in a couple grand on the on the mounts. So you kind of feel committed to them, which is yep, fine. Yep. So what you're seeing a transition to is most silencers are now coming with what they call a universal mount. So the universal mount means you could screw in a direct thread or you could shoe in a, screw in a quick detach, either one. So then you have the option either way. Yeah, yeah. But I would say if this audience is mostly thinking about hunting, hunting is always going to um, be the most accurate. So the other concern is people are afraid those those guns are going to, the silencers are going to walk off the threads as they're shooting. And so that's why you see a lot of people put wraps on there, again, so they don't get hot, but also so they can grab it and make sure the silencer's on there tight. It's a phobia in people's mind that it's going to walk off, but my experience is after you get carbon in there, it holds it in place, they're not going to walk off. Yeah, yeah. Through your testing, have you shot a suppressor enough where like it starts glowing? Oh yeah, Hot, for yeah. sure. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I have some M16, so it's fun to watch. Oh those. yeah. Oh yeah. First time I did that, um, I actually I thought the silencer was on fire because like the flame was coming out. And it was just the you know Duracoat or Cerakote or whatever yeah, yeah. It caught on fire. It scared nope. me though. Yeah, it's crazy. How many rounds? Like how many automatic rounds did it take you know, to get it? Get it, it wasn't paint. as many as you'd think with that one. Um, and I can't remember if it was Duracoat or Cerakote or what the gun coat they had put on the outside, but. Um, you know, I think it might have been. It was it was less than two thirty round mags. No kid. It's probably only forty five. It didn't take much to get oh, it. No, it's <laughs> like I said, it scared me. It caught me off guard. I'm like, oh, this thing's titanium. Why is this melting? <laughs> it's just the coating on the outside. Reminds me back in my Marine Corps days. We were, you know, we, we didn't have suppressors on any of our stuff, but shooting those machine guns, and you'd shoot them, and, and they'd say, oh, you got to do burst, but we'd pull the trigger so much that the barrel would turn, you oh, know, yeah. hot. That's hot cool. red like that, you know. Kind That's of cool. Of shooting. I've That's never shot suppressors enough to. I've got them where you can see the mirage pretty good. You're not oh, yeah. shooting at a running coyote for yeah. 20 rounds across the pasture. You oh, know, that's but, cool. That's cool. <laughs> no, that's that's crazy. <laughs> where do you see where do you see the suppressor market going in the future? Do you see, what what do you, what's like the next? Any ideas? What kind do you see like the next evolution in right. suppressors? I mean, is it just more so the the process? <laughs> I mean, is that where the evolution is going to take us to? That's a good question. To make the process I, better and easier for everybody to have them, or is there? A change in in technology yeah. or anything you know so the industry always tries to get creative and then when you get a democrat in office they typically feel a little bit empowered at the atf and they start cracking down on stuff so i think right now we're at a point with biden in office that most manufacturers are a little hesitant to try anything too great in a gray area i mean at silencer central we try to obviously stay away from the gray area because with licenses in 42 states you don't want to do anything that would jeopardize that but um you know, if you got Republicans in office for a while, you might start seeing more people push the envelope. And the hard part with that is that someone may make something like you've seen some of these um, weapons that they said, oh, it's not a short barrel rifle. And then later they said it was. Yeah. You get yeah. yourself in trouble. Yep. Um, you know, because everyone wants to do something where you buy one silencer and you get extra baffles, an extra tube or whatever. And you, but I just don't see the ATF letting you do that. Um, you know, 3D printing has been interesting to kind of watch that evolve. I, I think that that continued to maybe add different opportunities for, you know, being able to scale it up and be able to make a more. Um, that blows my mind. So I have a couple Daniel Defense waves. Yeah. And, and they when they were telling me about this process of 3d printing it it just blew yeah. my mind that yeah. like, they're making this entire suppressor out of a 3d printer you know totally, it's pretty yeah. wild and we haven't been able to you know we have that law enforcement one but we haven't been able to find one say for like the hunter that's a quieter design that would yeah, make yeah. sense yet. yeah um but no i i think the process side could be because i mean i every year i watch my market share because the atf will tell how many forms they processed in a year and then also they'll tell how many forms pretty much quarterly uh, or no monthly how many forms they have in their e-form system so i can nice. look and tell what my market share is nice. and every year i've seen my share grow yeah so i would what i would say is the message i see people responding to is the process yeah yeah 100 percent. it's, it's it, I always say, even I can sell the benefits of us mailing a suppressor to your front door, no matter where you live. <laughs> I mean, it was easy to do that during COVID, but it became even easier when people are like, oh, wow, you think of all this stuff you have to do to get a suppressor. You're telling me you could just mail it to me. If anything, I would say that it was hard for me to convince people that because when they heard it, they're like, that's too good to be true. That's not, yeah, that, yeah. there's no way that's possible. <laughs> well, before we go, I, we were conversating before the, the podcast started here and you talked about this wolf hunt. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I don't, I didn't even ask you. I mean, are you, have you ever hunted coyotes? You know, I have not. No, no. Because normally all my guests, I, I always have to, they I tell know. me their story of their first coyote they ever kill, you know. No, not, not even when you're shooting prairie dogs. You ever snipe one out there on no, the prairie dog No, no, I've never seen one. Isn't that weird? You know, I've seen them out pretty far away. I couldn't hit one. You know, yeah. I, I shouldn't say I, I did go on a coyote hunt with a guy one day up in Bismarck, North Dakota, one of my employees, but we didn't even see anything. So to me, it's like. <laughs> Typical coyote, right? Yeah, to me, it just, I, yeah. I, it almost feels like it doesn't qualify. Yeah, yeah. And I feel bad saying that because I would say for, gosh, the first 
probably 12 years of my business, 100% of my customers were coyote, coyote hunters, hunters in the yeah. Dakotas. Yeah, yeah. So I feel yeah. bad. <laughs> I always say that, like, I got so busy with this business that every weekend I was working gun shows, and I got two young daughters, so I feel like I was always at their events oh, during bet. the week, yeah. and I didn't get to travel as much. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Jason Vandenbrink, who's the CEO at Federal, I've gotten to be friends with him over the years at Federal Ammunition, and he told me about a place he went wolf hunting up in Canada. And, of course, I thought, Canada, you know, I can't use silencers. I don't want to go up there. Yeah, but he's like, you know yeah, what? It's, exactly. a, it's a lot of fun. You know, yeah. It's not that far from, you know, I could drive there from uh, Minnesota, you know, yeah. drive up from South Dakota through Minnesota and go up there. But um, I took a friend of mine who is a huge coyote hunter out of, um, he's in Minot. Um, he's an oncologist, and he is. A, I just met him for being a customer for years. Yeah. But I knew he was, like, he is obsessed 120 percent on coyotes he lives breathes and thinks about oh, that yeah, yeah. and he's a gear guy so he studies the gear and so when i told him i was like hey man i got a recommendation on a on a hunt we could go up and, and shoot wolves he's like man I'm, I'm in yeah so he and i booked it like a year ago <laughs> yeah and um we i i literally spent maybe four months just buying gear because i'm not used to going out hunting and now he was obviously hunting in minot north dakota yeah, in the cold yeah. but I literally spent three or four months just buying gear to get ready for this. So it was kind of an adventure in itself. What just, month were you heading up there? Uh, I went January. I was oh, there right, so yeah, you're right in the middle. I, I was the first group that came in January of this year. So, yeah, but, and it didn't end up being that cold. So it felt like a little bit of a lost opportunity. Like, you know, I spent all this money where I could go out negative <laughs> 30 on the yeah. snowmobiles. And yeah. then I find out there's no ice and we have to, you know, it was only like, you know, I think the coldest day maybe it did get negative 10 or something like that. But no, it was fun. I enjoyed it. Um, there's a guy up there. It was called Crawford Camp, and it's in Ontario, Canada. Okay. It's right over the border. I went through Baudet yeah, to yeah. cross over. Um, you know, of course, we couldn't have silencers. We had to, you know, pay a fee to bring the the firearms over. But um, yeah. Was it a bait a bait yeah, hunt? Bait. Yeah, Setting totally. up over the baits. So yeah, he'd been totally. baiting them, trying to get them to come in there. And yep. He's got eight bait stations. Nice blind. Yeah. A heater for you. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, I no? shouldn't say that. <laughs> no, he, no, he tried to scare us. He's like, don't, you know, he's like, don't turn the heater on because then he give them more chances to smell you. Oh. So he, <laughs> so he had a group out there earlier, and I won't say who they are because people might know who they are. But they saw, one guy saw 10 wolves, shot four times, and didn't hit any of them. Oh, jeez. Yeah. So basically his point to us was, guys, there's good cell phone reception here, but turn your phone off. You got to pay attention because when a wolf comes out there, he could only be out there for you know maybe a minute or 45 seconds, and if you let him get by, you just missed. You, yeah. you didn't even know he was there. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're like heads down. You got to focus. You got to be 100 percent ready. So um, you know I I didn't even turn the heater on. I was in there probably an hour <laughs> before light, and they what they do is they have a great process where they drill holes in the ice, put all the bait in there, and let it freeze. We freeze place. it in there so they can't yeah. drag it off. Yeah. And then the key was the birds. You want a ton of birds there because the birds are a signal to the wolves that it's safe to come out. So um, I was sitting there, and about 20 minutes after light, I saw one. And I got to be honest, I, since I've never been cow hunting, I was like, "Man, that's kind of small." <laughs> that's but but small. they told me they're yeah. like, dude, they're like, dude, there's a zero percent chance you see a coyote. Because what worried me is when you read the license, it said on there that coyote counts as a wolf. So you shoot a oh, coyote, you're done. You're done. <laughs> so I see it, I'm like, man, that looks low. It looks literally small. But they're like. There's zero chance there would be a coyote here. The how far was it, how far was it from me from the bait? About a hundred yards. 100, yeah, yeah. So so I shot him, and then um, you know I I text my guy and said I shot one, and he said he said you want another um, tag, and I go oh yeah for sure because yeah, if I see another one before in, you get here, yeah. <laughs> and literally as soon as I told him to, and he printed it, I shot another one. No kid. No, totally. I looked right. <laughs> you know what's funny is I actually scoped myself because I'm so used to wearing a silencer, which helps with the recoil. Yeah. And since I couldn't use a silencer because I was in Canada, and I put the rifle deep enough into the actual blind Shoot so window there yeah i wanted to be yep. quiet i think that's why i got another one but he was bigger he's a lot bigger i no knew for kid. sure he was a wolf so when they pulled up they're like it's a good thing we got two tags for you, you shot two wolves like <laughs> in the first half hour so what caliber g is on uh 257 weathery okay yeah smoke just dump them right down you know the first one he it, it, i hit, hit uh, her in the chest so she dropped oh yeah the second one i don't know how i screwed this up but I hit in the back like in the back uh back section it started spinning in circles so of course i got another shot at him and he was yeah, gone yeah, but yeah. i was embarrassed i'm like man he's probably only 200 <laughs> yards away how did i shoot that far left but he was moving a little bit so i don't know if i was shooting any and he took off a little bit and it shot in the back but no it was fun well, you might as well not even worry about coyote you've killed wolves before you even killed coyotes know, you know you're crazy? spoiled now that's yeah. like all of our coyote hunters dream is like to go shoot a wolf you know yeah and you know did what? your buddy get one yeah good question yeah. so he had to wait the full five days so the last day you know the, the pitch they always have there is that you really ought to go to the same place because they have like a i don't know eight mile radius or something that they're kind of yeah. swooping through yep. and that as soon as you start cherry picking and want to go to a different bait station you're not going to see anything yep. you're better to stay where you're at 
So yeah, he shot a monster. It was like 120 pounds. So wow. it, was, it was big, and I could tell he was super happy. Just you know, he'd been waiting the whole time. I think he felt guilty. He's like, ah, oh, you ought to go home. You know, Governor Noem had called me and said, hey, I'm doing an event. Um, you know, state of the state address, and she's like, I want to call out your company and all this stuff. And I'm, you know, I told her staff, I'm sorry, I'm actually <laughs> wolf hunting up in Canada. <laughs> My buddy's like, you should go back early. She invited you. I go, no, yeah. man. I signed up for five days. I'm here with you. We're in it for five days. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, on the last Did day. Did you hang out in the blind oh, with him? No. No? You know, they didn't ask us to do that. And I don't know why. I don't know if they were worried that. I mean, they were really big into like, don't move unless you have to. Yeah, Just yeah. Just because anything you do could scare little them. Little and they're so yeah. skittish. And they're so hard to kill. And you hear so many people that go on hunts four or five times and never even see one. Or they do and they don't shoot it. So yeah, yeah. I think we were like super paranoid. Like, you know, don't turn the heater don't on. Up. Yeah, don't, don't <laughs> use the don't. Don't bring your phone, you know, just focus outside exactly 100% the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know? like, thermal's legal up there, but um, you can't hunt at night with stuff. So I thought about bringing one just so in the morning I can kind of see, yeah, if there was one out there. Back in there a little deeper. And I think yeah. next year I, I might. You know, I asked the guys at the border, uh, you know, the agents there, Border Patrol. I was like, would you guys give me a hard time for this? They're like, yeah, probably. Next time, just keep in your car. Don't don't mention it. And I said, well, I don't have one now, but I am thinking about bringing one next time. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You getting mounted? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah full yeah. body. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Sent them to, yeah, I sent them to a group out of Pennsylvania to get them mounted nice. full body. So, yeah, I brought them back across the border, and then I just had my staff freeze them. Well, they, we froze them there, and then we were just going to – we just mailed them. How was that, bringing that a wolf back across you the border? Know, Did you know, CITES permit, so we had to yeah. get that before we left. Um, you know, the the Americans, I think, wanted to see – well, we got to the Canadians first, so the Canadians wanted to see them because they were just You just had a in back of your truck? You, you know, or did you have it in a cooler? So they, or what? They, or they skinned, you yeah, skinned it out? They skinned them all out. They yeah. put them in uh, actual trash bags. So they poured water in there, just like a frozen solid. Yeah. And then um, we brought, we had our CITES permits. They came and just sort of checked them off on the Canadian side. Then on the American side, too, they were kind of cool. Okay, we can't yeah, see we'll them. See yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it was just a matter of driving them back. And then yeah. um, the people we use, Kanadi up in Pennsylvania, they didn't ask for any paperwork too much. We just yeah, sent yeah. them the CITES permit yeah, and yeah. then my two permits for, because you can shoot two there a year. So um, I'm going back next year. I mean, heck yeah. yeah I'm like, dude, that was fun. It was cool. I liked it. <laughs> and it just, I don't know, part of the challenge, too, maybe just on the whole gear thing, because I'm not used to that. I mean, I grew up in the South. Like, you don't go out on frozen ponds. I mean, you, know, no. you die. Yeah. So the whole idea of, like, the layers and, the you know, the wool and the difference. I mean, it was cool. I enjoyed yeah, it. It yeah. just sort of, like, you know, it felt more manly to go out there and, like, man, it took me a half hour to get dressed. <laughs> I mean, this is legit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's bucket list for most guys. Probably everybody oh, yeah. listening to this podcast, Killing a Wolf. I'm I'm actually going up to Canada next year. Yeah, and I'm gonna we're gonna try calling them. Oh you yeah, you know the, the outfitter I'm going with does do the bait stuff, but yeah. I'm like. I'm not a big patience guy. Like, yeah. I have a hard time sitting on a coyote stand for 12 minutes, let right. alone sitting in a blind for eight hours, yeah. you know, waiting for a wolf. Yeah, so these guys have 85% success rate. I mean, That's pretty wild. Figure that's good. It out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Figure it out. And one expense, it was like three grand. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's pretty yeah. cheap. That's, that's now, cool. Now, they didn't supply any food or anything. I mean, they had a great facility because they're they basically a fishing lodge. So they had a great facility, but they're kind of like, hey, food's on your own. And, you know, we'll take you to the blind and we'll yeah. come pick you up at night. But, you know, so it's kind of hands off. But, hey, I like the price. You can drive Heck, there. So. Dang right. Hell yeah. That's success. Awesome. So, heck yeah, man. That's awesome. Yeah. It was well, welcome to the club, sort of. Yeah, right? totally. Yeah. I still got to go coyote. <laughs> yeah, you right? still got to get a coyote, though, <laughs> yeah, totally, right? Totally. 100%. <laughs> totally. Uh, well, last piece before I let you go. Wa- uh, walk me through the process. If somebody who's listening to this says, hey, yeah. I want to jump on, I want to grab a suppressor. I've talked about it before in this podcast. But you walk me through it real quick. Just what they need to do, yeah, how totally. easy it is. Totally. So, you know, there's really, I guess there's three ways to buy a suppressor from Silencer Central. One is if you see us at an event. The good thing about an event like here at this event is we'll do everything at the event. So we'll do your fingerprints. We'll take your photo. We'll create your trust. We'll let you sign everything digitally. And kind of when you're done, you know, when you walk out of here, you're done. So that's nice. The other thing is um, obviously people are listening to this and they don't have events that we go to near them. They can just call us. Um, I, just, I find people have a pretty good experience. We've got a full team of sales guys. They're all hunters. So you just call and say, yeah, hey, here's the, I'm, yeah, here's the covers. Here's the um, calibers I'm trying to cover. What do you recommend and why? And then just talk to the different options. The other is you can just buy buy online if you say hey i like the back country they were talking about i like the gold you were talking about i'm just gonna buy it online then once you buy it online or over the phone everything's on autopilot we'll send everything to you to sign digitally we'll send you a packet uh, where we train you how to do your own fingerprints and always say it's easy because if it was hard i'd be hearing complaints and i never yeah. hear any complaints yeah, i thought it was easy yeah yeah and then we scan those in and basically we're going to submit everything to the atf on your behalf so the, think of the business model is we're going to hold your hand the whole way through and we're also going to hold you accountable like hey we need to hear from you hey you got to fill this out like we yep. say on top of people which people like you know it's like yeah I got to call what I need to do next it's like hey call us we just got to confirm we got everything done and we'll submit it but once we submit everything to the ATF then we update you monthly on where it's at in the process 
The ATF will send you an approval the same time they send us. Then we'll send you one last form, the same form, that 4473 you yep. fill out when you buy a firearm. We have a variance to do that via DocuSign, so you fill that out. And then we actually mail the silencer from our location in South Dakota to the location of the state where you live, and then we ship it to your front door. So it's a smooth process. Yeah. And again, we like I mentioned earlier, we let you pay while you wait. So a lot of guys don't like to pay 100% up front. So if you don't yeah. mind just paying 150 bucks a month or whatever, we're fine with that. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't get much easier than that. Totally, 100%. You know? No, I mean, it's the whole business model to make it simple. Like, yeah. I think my new campaign should be like, push the easy button. I was a staples <laughs> yeah, that has that. Yeah, you know, there you guy. go. Just have three yeah. or four of those over at the booth, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, you're right. That's, I, need to, I need to tell them that. Hey, I, want to, I don't even know if they still have those. I think it was uh, a staples. Uh, Mitt Romney yeah. started that, right? Yeah, exactly. Guy, so. Exactly. <laughs> well, buddy, I appreciate you being on the podcast, yeah, man. That was, that was cool. I, I, I love the, the information, just the 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 research and the the history behind suppressors it's something i've been around them a long time and i've never been around somebody with your knowledge to it so that's been that's been great but i want to thank everybody for listening to this podcast and making it the number one predator hunting podcast out there um your reviews go a long way five star review on spotify um if you're looking to find information on myself you can go to my website which is coyotecraze.com you can find links to the last stand episodes on youtube season finale is coming up here shortly on that um you can find links to uh um, all my social media accounts and things like that. But uh, also, we can't do this without the, the sponsors, so got to thank them. We have Lucky Duck Predator Calls, Six Sour Optics, Cryptech, Silencer Central, Onyx Hunt, Swagger Bipods, and Hornady. And, of course, Eastman's for bringing this all to you guys. Can't thank, th- thank them enough. Head over to their website, which is eastmans.com. But until next time, we'll catch you right here on the Eastman's Predator Pros Podcast.